so on the respiratory model, here is number one. Number one is the nares or the nostril. Both of those will be acceptable on the test. Moving on to the inferior nasal concha, that would be up here, right here in the upper region of the nasal cavity. There. Next, down to the nasopharynx, which is actually going to be up in there, in the very back of the throat there, that upper portion directly behind the nose. Moving down, number four, there's the thyroid cartilage of the larynx. Notice it's above the actual thyroid gland, right there. Number six is the trachea, so moving on down, that'd be the windpipe right there and it actually extends up behind the thyroid gland. Number seven, primary bronchus. I'm gonna remove the lungs here real quick. And the heart. Coming out, okay. So here, the, the trachea is extending on down. Number seven being a primary bronchus. Number eight being a secondary bronchus. All right, now back on the lungs here. These are different, so this is on the left side of mine, but it is the right side, so this is the right lung. The right lung has three lobes. So here we have the right superior lobe. Yes, on the exam, I need you to tell me which lung and which lobe it is. Then you have the right middle lobe, the right inferior lobe, that's 9C. On the left lung, it's a little bit smaller because you have the uh, pericardial cavity there. So here we're on the left lung, that would be the upper lobe, and there's the lower lobe. Uh, the practice test also has these fissures. Um, I am not going to put those on our exam, so you do not have to worry about those. Okay? Turn the page on the practice test. Move, removing the lungs again. All right. So next we're going to get into branches of the pulmonary arteries and veins. Okay, so number 10 is the branch of the pulmonary artery. Remember in the lungs, arteries are carrying deoxygenated blood, so arteries in the lungs are blue. And there's an example of 11, that's a branch of the pulmonary vein. Veins are carrying the oxygenated blood back to the heart, so remember that's different in the lungs. All right, number 12, that would be the diaphragm right there, which is used to expand the thoracic cavity. It extends down, you can see it's a dome shape and then it flattens out during respiration to expand the lungs. And number 13, the hyoid bone is back up here near the top, there, at the top of the thyroid cartilage. Okay, digestive system, this is some newer material, so we're gonna be back up in the facial area. Number 14, this is the hard palate. There, top of the mouth there, hard palate. Number 15, this is the soft palate back in the back of the throat there. 16 is the tongue. All right, now the salivary glands. Let's see where it has parotid. There they are, they're on the other side. The parotid salivary glands are right there. They'll be on this side. Number 18, the sublingual. You can see they're right there under your tongue. Sublingual salivary glands. And number 19, the submandibular salivary glands. So here's where the mandible would be. So they'd be under the mandible. Remember it that way. Teeth, the teeth will not be on the exam. Number 20, that would be the esophagus. So we're gonna move down here into the cavity. So there's the esophagus. Moving down, it is, it is behind the trachea, okay? Number 21, that's 
going to be down here. So this is where the esophagus is actually permeating the diaphragm. And that is called uh, the esophageal hiatus. There's that area right there. 22 over here is the spleen. So there's the stomach. So there's the spleen on the left side of the body. 23 is the stomach. There's the stomach. We should all know what that looks like. 24 is the liver. I'm going to go ahead and take it out. I'm going to go ahead and remove the stomach. Twenty-five is the gallbladder. It is on the back of the liver there, so it's green. Um, you can remember that bile um, is going to be represented by green uh, on these models. Twenty-six is the pancreas. There's the pancreas right there. It'll be under the stomach. Turn the page talking about the small intestines. All right, so the small intestine is broken down into uh, three sections. So let me get these out here. So the initial superior portion is the duodenum. So you can actually look up in here and see where that's, this is the exiting of the stomach into the duodenum, so the superior portion here. The vast majority is going to be the jejunum. So that's this portion right here in front. Uh, so what everybody tends to think of as the intestines, that's the jejunum. It's about eight feet long. And on the back here, the distal portion of the small intestine, that's the ileum, ileum. And where it joins the large intestine is called the ileocecal valve, which would be this right here. The intestines are held together by mesentery, so this is just some connective tissue that helps uh, keep everything uh, together, bunched up, uh, and provide some support. Okay, moving on into the large intestine. Now, um, on the exam, I will have the large intestine removed, um, so it will, it will actually be um, a separate section, so you'll be able to pick it up and palpate it a little bit um, easier. Okay, so here is another place where the ileum is, right there. And so the ileocecal valve would be um, in there. All right, so now number 31, that's the appendix. The appendix is going to be on the back here, and it's at the, the very beginning portion of the colon. So we're going to break down the large intestine into its various segments, okay? So the first segment you, you encounter is going to be the appendix. All right, now 32. This has a lot of different sections. Okay, put it back together there. It is difficult to do one handed. Alright, there we go. Alright, 32A. This is the cecum. So, this is where you actually tuck the appendix back in um, after an appendectomy. So that's the cecum. Then you move up, or food moves up the digestive process. So it's up, so this is the ascending colon. Then you make a curve. This is the hepatic flexure because in the torso, it lies right under the liver. So that's gonna be the hepatic flexure. Then we're moving straight across. 32D, that's going to be the transverse colon because we're moving across okay 32e that's another curve this is the splenic flexure so it goes all the way across and because in it lies under the spleen so splenic flexure there then uh, digestive process moves on down so this is the descending colon so we're now descending all the way down and then there is the 
sigmoid colon because it sort of makes a little bit of an S here. There's no term for, for a curve. And so this is the sigmoid colon right in here. Turn the page. Back on the back. Alright. And this other portion here, 32H, that would be the rectum. So we're, we're um, the vowels are going to be connected, 32H, that's the rectum right in there. So I'll put that back. All right, uh, 32I, what's actually caudal would be the anus, that's actually this region right in here. Hostra, okay, hostra is a word meaning house. All right, and that's what is represented by these. I don't see it on here. Okay, well, a hostra is gonna be each one of these little pouches, just a little pouch, that's called a so it's a little house and that's where um, different parts of digestion take place and then there'll be some peristalsis that'll squeeze things to the next hostra so digestion is taking place in these little segments of the colon each one of those is called a hostra uh, 32k is the tinea coli so that would be these strips of muscles here, these strips of muscles, and what they're going to be doing is they're going to actually cause the uh, punching uh, and pouching of the colon into the hostra. So that's what, so this is the, the little muscles that form the hostra, and you can also see them, they're represented by this, this band, that's the tinea coli. All right, moving on to things we've already done before. Here are the adrenal glands. You can see they sit on top of the kidneys, both sides. There, uh, exiting from the kidneys, urine comes out through the ureters, one on each side, down all the way into the urinary bladder, and then blood entering the kidneys. There's the renal artery. It is red because it has oxygenated blood, and there's the renal. We do not have slides on ours, so we're going to move on over to our next set of models I'm here at the library. So the next one on your practice test is the stomach model in the digestive system. It looks like this. So we're going to be talking about regions of the stomach. This region here, you have to, let me set this here. This is how the stomach looks. So here, this would be like the esophagus up here, okay? So region A here, this is, is the fundus. This is the top of the stomach. When um, the stomach gets full enough that you start to get food and you have a lot of pressure receptors here. So when the fundus starts to get involved, you're going to, um, that's when you start to feel full. So that's where those pressure receptors are. B, this is the region called the cardius, the cardius, the cardiac region of the stomach. The vast majority of the stomach is the body. That would be this all down here. Okay, the body of the stomach. D, this is the pylorus. So this is where um, food is exiting the stomach into uh, the duodenum. E, this is going to be the lesser curvature, because see it's a little bit smaller there. F is the greater curvature down here, because it goes just longer, so that's going to be what's going to be the, the bottom of the stomach there. Alright, now this model also opens up. Now, remember this is where food is coming in. So the valve that leads from the esophagus to the stomach 
is called the cardiac sphincter. You may also call it the lower esophageal sphincter. Both of those are acceptable. So here, since this is called the cardiac sphincter, it makes sense that this is the cardius region of the stomach. All right. At the other end of the stomach, H, the valve that leads from the stomach to the duodenum is called the pyloric sphincter. Pyloric sphincter. So that's why this region of the stomach is called the pylorus. Um, there's a condition called pyloric stenosis, and um, it generally affects children. Uh, you'll notice in an infant's very, very projectile vomiting, um, and what they do is they go in and do a little surgical procedure and fix it. Now, the folds of the stomach here, represented by these wrinkles uh, and letter I, they are called rugi, rugi and that's what allows the stomach to expand. And again, once we get up more up here in the fundus region, there's a lot of pressure receptors there. So you're going to be, that's where, that's where you say, oh, I feel really, really full. Next one, the liver lobule model. Now we need this one. This one right here. Each lobule is a hexagonal region. Okay, so that would be letter A. Hexagonal region is a lobule. Within a lobule is a central vein. So here we're talking about hepatic portal veins now. All right, so there's a central vein. So it's kind of purple. Not quite full blue, but purple. All right, now, between these lobules, there are groups, and there are groups of three vessels. And the group of three vessels is called a triad. Now, each triad contains a hepatic artery branch that's red. A hepatic portal vein branch, that's the blue one. So there's a branch of the hepatic portal vein. And then F, that's a branch of the bile duct, so it's green. Okay? within these. So this is a more close-up model of each lobule. Okay, so if you look over here, here's, this is your bile duct branch, there. Uh, here's your hepatic portal vein branch, so here's kind of our triad, so there'd be our hepatic artery branch. Now we're looking at G. You've got these spaces here, these spaces, this is a sinusoid, so they're just spaces within the lobule. This is what they look like on the outside. So they're just spaces. Notice this is not part of a hepatic portal vein. This is just a sinusoid. Okay. H. These are called, this is a, one of these is a bile canaliculus. And it's just a transportation. So you can see it's sort of green and it's transporting to the bile duct branch. Okay. So there it is. And then you have I, each of these individual cells here, that's a hepatocyte. And then in the close-up, this would be the central vein, because we're talking about the middle of the lobule. And then to the large liver model. This looks very busy. It is not near as complicated as it looks. All right. J. This would be the inferior vena cava. And it's at the top of the liver. So here we're looking at the back of the liver. In your body, it looks like this. There it is. That's how it sits on your in your body. Okay. So we're looking kind of at the inside there. So here, this is this is the back side of the liver. So there's your uh, inferior vena cava. It can be there's the outside, there's the inside of it. K. The hepatic portal vein is going to be, on this model, represented by gray. So here's where uh, blood's coming from the uh, stomach area, and then it branches off all into what would be the lobules there. Okay. L, the hepatic artery, which is right here. So there's your hepatic artery and then it branches off into all these other M, 
is the gallbladder. That would be this structure here. It's what holds the bile. In is the hepatic duct. So this is where things can kind of get a little bit confusing. So bile is getting made in the liver, all these green things. So here's the hepatic duct. So this is where bile is going. This is where it can be um, ejected from the liver directly out. So this is the hepatic duct. This here is the cystic duct because cyst cystic refers to bladder. So you're talking about the gallbladder. So removal of the gallbladder would be called a cholecystectomy. So cystic duct is the duct from the gallbladder. So hepatic duct, cystic duct. These then join together to form P, which is the common bile duct. And this is what actually injects bile into the duodenum, so for digestion purposes. Now, on the outside of the liver here, regions of the liver, Q, which is on this side, that's the left lobe, R, that's the right lobe. So, if you're looking in anatomical position, there's the liver, so left lobe, right lobe. And then, lastly, you have the hepatic vein. Which is going to be right here, hepatic vein. And that's what actually empties into the inferior vena cava. So that's the large liver model. The last model that I'm going to go over is back over here. This one also looks a little busy, but this is a close up of the pancreas, spleen, and duodenum. So this is the pancreas, here's the spleen, here's the kidney, there's the adrenal glands, kidneys, adrenal glands. Okay, there's the duodenum, liver, gallbladder. Now let's go over this in detail. Alright, so A, that would be the spleen. So spleen, remember, is going to be over on the left side of the body, this part right over by the stomach. There's the spleen. The adrenal glands are sitting here on top of the kidneys. That's B, you have two of them, two adrenal glands. C, the splenic artery, so that'd be a blood vessel. So we're talking about arteries, in this case, oxygenated blood, carrying blood to the spleen, so that'd be C. D is a kidney, so there's one kidney. There's the other kidney, sitting right below the adrenal glands. This is the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. It is important that you know which region it is. F, okay, this is a structure called the plique circularis. These are the circular folds, and what they do is they really increase the surface area because there you've got space down in each one of those, so you've got a whole lot of room for food to go to process uh, for digestion. Important to know what those are. G, that would be the pancreas. The pancreas is this whole thing here, just represented by the letter G. H, the common bile duct. So here we are, right up on the liver again, liver area. So this is where, that's this is the common bile duct, right there. So here where this would be the, um, hepatic duct, this would be the cystic duct because there's the gallbladder, there's the liver going on down and the common bile duct is going to inject directly behind the pancreas into the duodenum for digestion. Down here. I is the accessory pancreatic duct. So this here is one of the ways that the pancreas is going to inject its digestive enzymes directly into the duodenum. J is the main pancreatic duct. So you got two of them, so here's the main one. This is the big one because it's kind of in the middle of the pancreas there. This is the accessory one, so one can be blocked and you can still get um, 
enzyme so you can still digest things. K. Now look here, this is important. This is called the hepatopancreatic duct. And this is where the common bile duct, so it's going on down here. So there's the common bile duct up there, but it you can see it moving all the way here and the main pancreatic duct merge and they're going to empty into the duodenum together which is this you know right over here and this sphincter is called the sphincter of ODI ODDI that's not on the test labeling the sphincter of ODI all right back up here once again here is the liver there's the gallbladder there's the common hepatic duct coming from the liver, there is the cystic duct, and then they merge to form the common bowel duct, which goes all the way down. And that concludes the digestive system.